So today is Sunday, April 7th, 2024. We have uh, President uh, Trent Lyon and Sister Susie, Susan Lyon. Um, Trent was, or President Lyon was the uh, fifth stake president of the Globe Arizona Stake, and they're going to visit with us about their experiences in the Globe Stake. So first of all, thank you for being here. We really appreciate you taking the time to share some of your stories with us. I'd like to start with, with Sister Lyon. Uh, you grew up pretty much in the Globe Arizona State. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes, we moved here when I was about four, um, when we were still St. Joseph Stake. And I think within the year, um, we were made into our own stake at, at Globe Stake. So I was about five. And we grew up in the Globe Ward, and it was one ward at that time in the old building on Sycamore next to the post office. Um, I remember there were lots of good families, lots of the, um, memories of the people who were part of that ward at that time. And it grew to the point by the time I think I was eight when they made it into two wards. It was just after I was baptized. And I remember. Um, when I was baptized, how many, um, I was baptized with um, one of the families was a stinky. And so their boy was baptized at the same time I was. Um, and it was my birthday. So I got to be baptized on my eighth birthday after church. It was a Sunday. And um, as I was baptized, there was a lot of Melchizedek priesthood, as my dad put it. He said, wow. There's a lot of members here in their work. By August that year, we got split into two wards. So that was neat to um, be part of that and remember all those Melchizedek priesthood holders. Um, trying to think, there probably was about 20 good Melchizedek priesthood holders there that helped confirm um, at that time. And that was a neat feeling to know that the ward was growing and the strength that that had. Um, and at that time, I think, when the word was split, the Globe Board was split, um, my dad was bishop and his first counselor was put in the, as the bishop of the other ward. So that was kind of neat to see that and the strength growing there. As what, far, go ahead. What do you remember about the old building? Uh, the baptismal font. <laughs> the baptismal font was in the basement of the building. And so that was kind of interesting. Um, so you'd go down the stairs. Um, and it, it also had stairs to go up. So we would, they had one room that had a balcony and you weren't supposed to go out on it. They tried to close those, but you tried to get where you could go on the balcony. And that was kind of fun to see the balcony. What did um, the balcony overlook? Just the back, just over the grounds. Like outside? Yeah. Okay. And then they also had um, where you slid down the banister. <laughs> you never so, did that, did you? Oh no. <laughs> I think Katie actually twisted her ankle one time doing it, so it was kind of fun that um, it was just an interesting layout for a building. Um, they had the junior primary, and then they also had the um, chapel behind it. Uh, it was it was an interesting layout of was the it, building. Was it built originally as an LDS church, or was it a church? That... I don't know. It, it was. I think it In was. In two phases. But it wasn't a typical fashion. It was built... Um, how they decided it wasn't like a typical LDS building, you would say. The Stig Center probably was our first one that was more of a uh, where, one. Where did they have junior Sunday school and primary? Right behind the chapel. So they had the chapel and then they had a just a little board between so they could actually open it and then go even further back and turn it around. What, so was, it, what was upstairs? Upstairs, primary, primary classes. I don't know why you would put primary upstairs, but they did. <laughs> So you had lots of little kids running up and down. And we also had junior Sunday school at that time too. So when our format of that building was mainly um, primary, or not primary, primary during the school week. And so it was junior Sunday school and Sunday school and church at different times of the day on Sunday. So how did primary during the school week work? That was fun. Um, I think we changed to block about the time I was 10. So we would do primary. Um, and we were probably, what, six blocks or so from the school, from the, it was East Globe. So would that be about six blocks? Give or take. So we would walk from school lots of times. We'd get out about three, 
not quite 3.30, but we try to get to the church because um, primary started about 4, I believe. But they'd always do fun activities before. So we'd always try to get to the church pretty quickly. There's about a group of anywhere from five to eight of us walking at a time. And we just walk down and go to primary and they'd have singing time and then they have a primary class. But we'd always try to get there early so we could do the activity. So it was fun. Lots of um, good memories with primary. I think we celebrated the hundredth year of primary during our time. And so we had a maypole and a big primary activity day around the 100th year of primary. And we built up to it for months before trying to do different crafts and stuff to um, show um, primary and um, the different things that primary does. So it was kind of fun. So do you remember, um, do you remember this creation of the stake at all? When the stake was put in as... When it became a stake in 1974. Very little. My recollection that I seem to have, um, and I could be wrong, but I think we met at the Miami Ward Building. It wasn't a stake center yet. Um, it wasn't because they moved, but it was just the Miami Building. And we met there when it was created, I believe. And it was kind of interesting because um, the, they made the stake but we didn't have any stake offices or anything like that. And we only had two buildings. And at that time we had two big wards um, in Globo, Miami. And then of course um, you have Kearney, San Carlos and Superior, um, but there was no room for uh, stake offices or anything. So they brought in a mobile trailer and put it behind the Miami close to the railroad track. And so they put the state building there with a mobile, I think it was a double white. And they had the little state offices behind that building for a while. So that was interesting. So as a youth growing up in uh, the Globe Second Ward and the Globe Stake, um, what kind of memories do you have of that? What was that like? It was fun. It was a period of growth. So um, lots of families started moving in. So we went from one Globe Ward to two Globe Wards. And we also had um, one Miami ward and they went to two Miami wards at that time. And a lots of it was the youth. Um, so we seemed to have a lot of youth and families with youth that time. And then of course you had Kearney that was um, pretty big at that time. And then you had um, Superior that was a branch when we started and it went to Superior Ward during that time. So it was a period of growth in the state. So um, we went from what was it, four units, five units, to, there would have been two, three, four, five, six, seven units. Is that correct? Because you have two Miami, two Globe, Superior, Kearney, San Carlos. So they had that, and again, Superior was a ward. It wasn't just a branch. Um, during that time, it grew to a ward. So it seemed, and lots of it was youth. So that was um, lots of youth, um, big girls camps, it felt like. I mean, we're talking big, not... Um, well, talk Sunday, about Girls Camp. So big. Talk about Girls Camp. Girls Camp was over at the YMCA camp, I think it was. And we had an agreement if we go help them start at the beginning of the year, get it set up to go, that they would let us use it. Um, and it was fairly inexpensive that they would loan it to us. And so we would go out there and spend one, if not two Saturdays in May, just cleaning it out and getting it ready and getting water ready to go. Um, that was, we had like, you had to build a fire in order to get hot water. Um, very rustic, yet it had cabins, lots of spiders. Uh, <laughs> they had a string nearby. Uh, they had a swimming hole we went to, probably not as safe as it could have been, but it was still very fun. Very cold, um, but it was fun. It was a great experience of um, being able to go out in the woods um, and yet, not have too much camp room, but still have something around you. So good leaders for girls camp, uh, good experiences. Um, I'm trying to think of a standout. I think the standout is just having the girls. You know, I think my favorite was being a YL uh, youth leader and having the younger girls um, and teaching them and having them get excited. And um, testimony meeting was always, where you thought, okay, I'm not going to do this because it's going to be too hard, but 
you would always get up along the various testimony and share the love you have um, of the Savior, but also of the people that um, and the experiences you had with them helping you grow. And you did, I think being in nature helps you, um, it takes you out of your um, comfort because at that time we didn't have cell phones or anything like that. But it still, you had a telephone, you had your regular routine, so it kind of took you out of that, so you kind of had to see what was in person. Um, so it kind of puts you in touch with um, Heavenly Father in a different way, I believe. I think you kind of get to a more um, real level, you know, what is the value with the person. I always thought that was really much close to them. So I got my experience with the close camp. Drove some of the leaders crazy. I talk, I like to stay up and talk, and I, to this day, I still get reminded how much I kept some of the leaders up talking, but it was a good experience at Girl Scouts. Now, there was some sort of, I, I guess maybe you call them super activities um, that you had as a youth in the stake. Um, there was, uh, for example, I'll talk about, if you can, the Horizon activity for the young women. Yeah, Horizon was, I was in high school, that was a period of time where I probably needed it the most. Um, you're trying to figure out who you are and what you want. And at that time, um, one of my sisters just got graduated from high school. Uh, Martha and I were still in high school, so Laura was just starting BYU. Uh, Martha was in high school, I was in high school, and Katie just barely was a beehive. So we had, but Laura was still 17. And it was from 12 to 7 to 12 to 18. So with that, all my sisters and I go to Horizon. And a couple of the memories I remember the most from Horizon was one, they asked us to wear all in white. So we got to pick a white dress out and we had, we took a family photo. With our white dresses. And that just stood out in the sense of a prayer family. At that time, it wasn't, you didn't post for photos. It just kind of was because there were just the cameras. You didn't have your phones. It wasn't a selfie, but, and it's not always the best quality of pictures, but just the fact that we got to be all together. And that seemed to be a picture that my mom liked well enough that she made copies to kind of remind us of that. And it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't a photo that was necessarily post or anything for, but the fact that we were all together and we saw the white dresses, I think she could have tried to help us. See the fact of being an eternal family, she never really said too much of it, it's just the fact that she did it and she liked that picture because all her daughters were in it and we're all together. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So that such thing I got from film from going to Horizon. But also um, we had a heart director junior there and we also had um, where we could, we had a big sacrament of all the girls and it was big, the whole, um, center was filled and there was, it's noisy, you have girls, girls talk, um, but when we started sacrament, um, especially we just had opening song and a prayer and then we had sacrament and that was very quiet. Who, who passed the sacrament? All the, all the sick residents and bishops and any other leaders that came and it did take quite a lot of time. That was a full center, and so um, it probably took about, I was thinking, recollecting back, it was probably about 20 to 30 minutes. And even though it was, um, we'd been in there and it'd been very busy and very buzzing during other talks and things during the sacrament, it was very quiet. And it was just a time to reflect and think. I, thought, I wish every sacrament meeting could concentrate that long because they only went an hour. Then half of the meeting was for taking of the sacrament and thinking about the importance of our covenant. And I'm sure not all of us did that at that time. But then when you think back to why were we doing this, 
it, that was one of the thoughts that came over and over again as a theme. I think I was a my need at the time. The my new merriness. Anyway, of the 14 to 15 year olds that came back as we talked about it, as we came back for a race, and it was that it was impressive that it was that quiet for that amount of time to reflect and think about our Savior. So even though it was a long amount of time and not everyone, like I said, probably thought about the Savior the whole time, they really that time was for that. And so that was one of those recollections that you think that um, importance of renewing your covenant to the point of um, the amount of time it took, you know, because most of the time it's only a few minutes during the sacrament weekly in a regular sacrament meeting, but that kind of made it a lot longer, so it's like, okay, so that was one of the recollections we had of, of Horizon. And I, I don't know that we covered this. Where where did Horizons take place? It was up at Blackstaff. At NAU? At NAU. And so we got to stay in the dorms and um, use their facilities. Now, while you were still a youth, the state did a youth trip to Nauvoo. We did. Can you tell us about that? I think I was um, either junior or senior. I think I was a senior. And so we, um, the seminary started eating, um, ready to go to Nauvoo. It was, we were reading the Doctrine and Covenants. And um, when we went to Nauvoo, um, we started with our Glow Miami and then pulled Kearney in, so it became a steak trip instead of just a, a, a Ward Ori one. So we did the whole steak. And instead of a seminary trip, it became a steak trip um, because we were going to originally just do a seminary trip. But it got taken over and was a steak trip, so all the steak got to go. Um, there were many stories um, from the leaders because they had about one leader for every three kids. And that's a lot of leaders to get. And the leaders paid for their own way. It wasn't um, paid for by the state. We did a few um, a few um, um, activities to yeah, earn money for it, but the adults weren't part of that. The adults just did it. And, we kind of were short. Um, it came about March and we were short leaders, but um, they would call leaders and say, hey, would you be able to get this much or would you be able to come to Nauvoo? And lots of leaders told a little stories that just happened to work out that they could get the finances to go. I remember one person saying um, that they, you know, there was no way they could go, but they would think about it and get back to And they said, you know, within two weeks, they were able to find the funds to be able to do it, and we're very happy we were able to do it. Um, when we went, it was, um, we took a train. It was right after the conference. Where'd you get on the train? We got on it in, I think it was in New Mexico. So we did the conference, right after the conference, we left. Our car happened to break down. We made it three miles out of town. Thank goodness we weren't the changing car. So the car coming in behind us picked us all up and we went into their van and we, so we were already one car short um, and we got to um, New Mexico and we, they picked us up, the stake there, made arrangements and we stayed there for a night and then we took the train the, in the morning and we went, it was like um, all day, then we spent the night, um, girls were on one side, guys were on the other side of the train and then we got there the next day. So it was all night. It was kind of just really fun. It was... Um, well, when you say you got there the next day, you didn't get... The train doesn't go to Nauvoo. How'd you get... Oh, yeah. Well, we got to... Um, where was it? St. Louis? Yeah, St. Louis. And then um, we were there. I went to... Where was the different ones in... Hannibal, maybe? No, we didn't go there. We went to the... There was the big ice cream dome thing. What was that from the other church that we got to go to? I'm not sure. The Community of Christ. Yeah, the Community of Christ one. We got to see that in passing, and then we went to um, Liberty Jail. And when we went to Liberty Jail, I remember going in, and I thought, oh, they're going to take us through this little building, and it's going to be in the backyard. You know, they're going to take us through to see Liberty Jail. And so we went in there, and um, it's right in the middle of the um, visitor center. You go through, and then you look, and you see Liberty Jail, and they let us walk through it. Very humbling, even as a kid. 
I remember going in, and I'm not that tall, I'm about 5'5", five five, um, but I remember saying, I couldn't even stand here for, you know, all the way up without trying to, so I can't, you know, this man, um, the men who were with Joseph, and Joseph being six foot, they could never at any time stand for the months they were incarcerated. And I'm sure it was cold for us then in June. I'm sure it was very cold during the winter. So with that, and there was, you know, no facilities to use for the restroom for them. And it was just a very humbling feeling to realize the amount of time that was spent there for them. And so that was the beginning of our trip was there. And then we got to go to Nauvoo, which was fun. Um, there was lots of, and we had a different state help us with cars getting there and getting back. Um, and when we went to Nauvoo, um, now that was Liberty Jail. We got to go to Carthage as we were in Nauvoo. And I think that was where I, I just remember standing and thinking how I was very blessed to know that Joseph Smith was a real prophet. I just remember that feeling. And it doesn't always come at sights, but I just remember that feeling of just knowing that, um, he was willing to give his life and be martyred because he knew the truthfulness of the gospel and he was willing to do whatever it took for it to go forth. And I just remember that feeling of how he felt us. And the Prophet Joseph has always been one of my favorites. Um, but I really appreciated just being able to go where he had gone and be part of that. That was just really neat. And I didn't, we just did a one day in Nauvoo, so it was pretty quick. But all the rest of the little things we got to go to were just faith building. And I think lots of the youth felt that way. And then as we were going back, when we stopped and someone came and talked to us about the baptistry, um, that was, you know, the only foundation they had of uh, the Nauvoo Temple. And remember thinking, that's so sad that the Nauvoo Temple is not here anymore. And at that time, we, it was never a thought that they would um, rebuild it. But just standing there, and that was one of the pictures I did take, um, was just seeing that foundation and just having it happen um, there before. That was a neat feeling of being where the Nambu Temple was. And then years later, of course, they rebuilt it. And I thought, I've been there before. It was just a neat experience to realize that's where it started. So those were a couple of fun experiences that we had that were that were good experiences for youth to have. And at the time, we were probably more silly, but there were lots of testimonies that were built through some of these activities. So you uh, you went to school at Eastern Arizona College. Mm -hmm. um, then you went on to BYU, and this is where. President Lyon comes into the picture. Yeah. Um, who would like to explain how you met? <laughs> Depends on if you want the real story. <laughs> so, uh, this was, I had just come back from my mission serving in Sweden and Finland, and we lived just down uh, from campus in a house beautiful pink house uh, next to another house that was on the corner um, and uh, I think <clears throat> my first recollection of meeting Sister Lyon was when she and a friend because we were in the same ward uh, she and a friend Becky Dawson who was also a <laughs> member here in, in Globe at the time but was there at BYU and it had been raining and they were out splashing in puddles is that the first recollection? Is that? One of them. Okay, one of them. So anyway, so that was the first time that we kind of met was when they came to our door and said, hey, we're out, it's raining, uh, and we're out, especially the puddles having fun. So that was our first introduction, uh, but we had other interactions as we were there in the ward, and um, there was a, an eventual, there was a dance that was happening and uh, so I invited her to that dance, um, and there's a lot of in-between stuff there as well, but <clears throat> long story short, I invited her to the dance. Uh, I happened to go, we happened to go with 
a girl that was in her house and a boy that was in my um, my house as well, Fletcher Chambers and Marie, and uh, they already kind of knew each other, I think, a little bit before, but Susie and I didn't really know each other, but we'd seen each other, and so that's, you just kind of, that's dating. You're just trying, you're dating someone to kind of get to know them a little bit better. Anyway, it was, uh, we went to Bridal Hill Falls in Provo, and that's where the dance was held, uh, and so we uh, had that adventure at first, and I think that went okay. And so we started kind of dating after that. Um, again, long story short. So that's where we kind of ended the picture, just being uh, in the same ward. And it's kind of taboo because you don't want to date someone in your own ward because it really makes it difficult if you stop dating them. But, uh, but it seemed to work out okay in, in that instance anyway. And you never stopped dating her either. Nope. Nope, we still date. Still dating her. Do you have any? Do you have anything to add to the story, Sister Lyon? Um, well, we went with, um, like you said, we had my sister had set up where she was in that house before, and she had good luck with it. So she got me into that house with her old roommates. Um, so we met through the year before. So she said it was a good house, and Fletcher was in Trent's house, and I knew him at least before I met him as he came off his mission. So, and then I had my roommate Marie. How we did like. Other lines, uh, present lines. So we went on our double date, and they were interesting enough. They got engaged like ten days later, and we're ready to get married. And we weren't quite to that point, but it was it was a fun experience to start dating. And then I was getting ready to go on a mission. Actually, I talked to the bishop once, and he said, um, "Why don't you come back? And because your birthday's not till June, so why don't you come back in December?" Um, and Becky was already putting in her mission papers, and she was my roommate as well, Becky Dawson. And so um, I said, okay, I'll come back in January, um, and we'll think, you know, start working on that. And um, before January, though, I think he kind of approached me and said, you know, this mission thing might be a later time. <laughs> um, and it ended up that our mission thing is a later time. So, so you both got degrees from BYU. Correct. Uh, tell us what you studied or what you got degrees in. So my degree was in secondary education, um, history, uh, teaching uh, with uh, minors in um, English uh, language as well as Scandinavian studies. And elementary education. So both education majors. And you graduated at the same time, right? Uh, or close? Not, not quite. So. Uh, we were, we were looking for jobs. Um, we kind of found a loophole in the BYU catalog. I was planning to do student teaching. Usually student teaching is required, a period for student teaching. And you usually would do that in the fall or the spring. And, uh, but they had a section for summer. And so I, I asked the dean about that. And he said, well, that's really for exceptions or other cases. I said, yes, but it's offered as a class. So if I did that, then I would actually be ready for a job in the fall as opposed to doing my student teaching in the fall, just kind of trying to take advantage of that. And they said, well, I guess we could probably work it out. And so I ended up doing student teaching in Taylorsville, um, as well as a reform school or a, um, uh, a school in the Orem area uh, where it was more of a correctional kind of a school. So had two different experiences there. Uh, we were gonna be interviewing, we were interviewing on the day of our graduation, uh, or my graduation in, uh, Idaho, and that didn't work out. And so my plan was to go up to Oregon, where I'm from, and to uh, teach up there, trying to get into my high school where there was an opening, not only for a history teacher, but also for a cross country coach. And I thought, well, gosh, as soon as I get up there, they'll recognize that that's, gee, you know, this is, this is who it's supposed to be because here's someone who's coming back to the school to teach. Um, and I didn't understand politics at the time, what I should be doing or talking to and doing those kinds of things. And uh, it didn't work out that way. So we were up in Oregon and uh, eventually uh, weren't finding jobs up there as readily. And then I got a call from a principal down in, uh, was it San Carlos first? It could have been. We got a principal who called from San Carlos and so we, from San Carlos, uh, Arizona, and so we came down and interviewed 
for that position, then went back up to Oregon, and then a little bit later, right before school started, we received a call from... I think the, it was the week after school started. The week after school started, yeah. the principal called and said, hey, I don't know who you are, uh, but someone met you at your wedding reception, said you're a nice guy, you have a teaching certificate, would you come down to Globe? I said, well, if you'll fax a contract to me until I know it's serious and not just going down in front of the trip. And so uh, that was that. And we started, we packed the car up on uh, probably a Sunday, Saturday? It was Friday. Friday? Friday afternoon. <clears throat> packed okay. up on Friday to get there so we could start teaching on a Monday, second week of school. Um, on a five-seventh contract, I think it was, five-seventh contract. For about sixteen thousand dollars. So what's you know, five sevens mean? That means you're teaching. There are seven periods a day, and you they they gave me five periods uh, of classes. So it wasn't a complete contract, but it was complete enough that the superintendent the next year um, renewed that and made it a full time contract. After there was a lot of other things that happened, so um, they decided to keep me, which was a good thing, and uh, uh, so that. That's what brought us to Globe, really, was the change of plan from going to Oregon to uh, coming here and having someone who had met us talk to the principal, and uh, yeah, just kind of a surprise, kind of an interesting, it's kind of a theme is surprises. You don't always expect how things work out. Eventually, career-wise, you became a principal, and then you worked in the district office. Uh, what... Uh, when you first came here, what were your impressions uh, of the community, your impressions of the church here? What were your thoughts? You know, when we first got here, we were, uh, we had just good people looking after us, um, especially as we were looking for homes. We didn't have a whole lot of money. Well, most of the money we had to go uh, was going toward getting ready to uh, find a place to live. Uh, we lived with my in-laws for the first little bit. Um, we already had one child, our oldest Lily, and uh, and there was another little boy who was on the way. And so we were starting our family and we wanted to make sure that we had things taken care of and there were just good people who were looking out for us. Uh, Church-wise, we were in the Globe Second Ward. We started in the Globe Second Ward and I worked in the young men's organization there, and uh, and that was fun to work with the youth. I always uh, uh, have enjoyed working with youth, whether it's scouting or other kinds of things, and uh, so that was a wonderful opportunity. But the the house that we found was in Miami uh, or Miami, and uh, so that wasn't a problem for us. It was a it was a good sized home. We thought that we could grow into, and so we go in the Miami ward, and uh, that was uh, kind of fun as well. Um, but the impressions from there is just good people in Globe. Uh, I come from a musical background, so we had <clears throat> musical people, uh, Bonnie Merrill, uh, the Machulas, and others who, uh, the Daltons, Brother Rainer, uh, the Daltons, just people who, uh, were active in the church and doing good things, and um, in the Miami Ward, same thing, just good, solid people. And that's, I think, my, was our impression, was just it was good to be around good, solid people. And uh, Susie was one who had probably swore that she would never come back to live in her hometown, and, and yet uh, her hometown had a lot to offer. Uh, at least that's kind of where we were. But we were living a busy life, a uh, lot of things going on, all at once, uh, as many young families are. Uh, but just enjoyed that, that those first few years that were here, even though, yeah, they were stressful. Now, after you moved to Miami, uh, after a period of time there, you were called out to San Carlos to serve. Tell us about that. So, so backing up a little bit, um, uh, I was serving in, eventually serving in the, the bishopric of the Miami Ward with uh, Bishop Glenn Redford, and uh, I, had a, I was, a, I was a, the first counselor working with the young men and had been attending a scouting event on a Saturday, 
And uh, <clears throat> President Wolf came to talk to me and said that he wanted to visit with me. And to visit with me, and I said, well, I have a bishop meeting, and maybe I could do that at a later time, you know, after bishop meeting. He says, why don't you come before bishop meeting? Bishop meeting. And so I went to, we went to the stake and visited, and uh, Bishop Redford had already been talked to about uh, us going out to San Carlos, uh, because when I, when I walked in, he had some uh, Apache music in the background as I walked in the bishopric meeting, and uh, he said, I think I know why you went, and, and you know, kind of spilled the beans on that. So uh, it, it was a quick transition from being uh, in the Miami ward to serving out in San Carlos. And uh, this is San Carlos. San Carlos was uh, a shift and a difference for us, uh, but a great experience for our family. Um, again, we had young children. And uh, so we went there, and there are a lot of uh, other supports that were there in uh, the San Carlos branch. And we knew some of them from stake activities, but really didn't know as much about the branch. And so there was a lot, there was a steep learning curve in terms of knowing who people were, how does the branch operate differently from a ward. Uh, but it gave us a wonderful opportunity to kind of stretch our wings and do some different things. We knew that um, President Dalton had been out there before. There were some people who were already serving out there. And uh, Brother Bonnie served as my first counselor, Oval Bonnie, and Stephen Burke as my second counselor. Uh, but we also had other families who were educators who were living out there, the Ullery family and their uh, daughters, as well as a, a family that had some, some kids who were our age, uh, the Prestons, and they were teaching out there. So it was helpful to have some support that was there to be able to help with the young men's program, the young women's program. And um, we uh, realized that uh, San Carlos did operate di very differently. Um, but it was a blessing to have the counselors I did because we could go out and spend a lot of time visiting. Uh, and we would visit after meetings, we would visit uh, during the week, usually at least once if not twice a week, uh, just out uh, seeing the members, uh, visiting with people, finding out where people live, just trying to figure out where people live was one challenge. Uh, and uh, that was fun because you, uh, there were sometimes streets that were marked and other times streets that were not marked. And uh, you found out who was connected to who, who's, you know, there were different uh, family connections that you had to be aware of. And you had some stalwarts who were there uh, in uh, the branch itself. Uh, you realized that there were some cultural uh, aspects of the branch that allowed people to be at a wake over the weekend come very tired to church and then go back to that wake to be able to uh, pay respects to those who had passed on. Um, but it was, a, it was a huge blessing to be able to get to know our um, San Carlos brothers and sisters and be able to serve with them and see um, their, their beauty, their faithfulness, um, as well as the challenges that they faced and, and how the branch could be able to help and support uh, them and their families uh, the best we could. We had one missionary that went out to serve uh, and that was a challenge to leave the reservation and to even though they, you go off to college sometimes coming back off a mission or going to a mission that was, those are hard things uh, to be able to ask people to do but uh, that gave us and we were hoping to be out there even longer um, Dude, he said, I'm actually went to the temple that time too. Sister, we had people going to the temple. We had again, we so we we really tried to, and I uh, I bought a Polaroid camera because um, I realized that there were people who would come and go, and I didn't always know who they were, and so I wanted to make sure we knew when we were talking at our branch council meetings, this is who we're talking about. Here's who these people are, or I would ask, and so if someone came in at the back of the the old this the old San Carlos Church. Um, I, was, I would ask people to stay, and then we would take pictures of each person, and then we'd post them in, in the office so that we could see them. And that way we knew we were talking about individuals, and those individuals um, 
and their needs and what they could do. And sometimes they would show up once and then they would show up again a month later. And sometimes they were visiting from White River and we knew who they were. We wanted to make sure that they knew that when they came, that we knew who they were. Um, What's a Polaroid camera? <laughs> What's a Polaroid camera? That's a cassette tape. Um, <laughs> So the Polaroid camera, and they have, they have them today even, where you just take the picture and you can immediately just wait for it to be processed, the chemicals in there, allow you to see the picture or have the picture immediately after you've taken it. Um, this was a time before cell phones and before um, the nice cameras that we have kind of today. So the Polaroid camera allowed us to take a picture and immediately see that we could uh, have the picture of the person and show them that we had that. and. Um, Eventually, we kind of gave some of those back to the people once we knew them, but uh, we could take pictures of those pictures and have them for them. Um, Out of all the callings that um, our kids helped us with, you know, throughout the years, they say that San Carlos was their favorite. So they, they enjoyed the food always. You always had to have food, but they just really enjoyed the people. They enjoyed, they, le they learned how to have fun. Yeah. Um, and again, they grew up in a primary where Sister Shorten was there. Um, and Sister Curly. Sister Curly. Just, you know, and Reed, uh, our younger, or Reed um, said that, he, you know, when he, he says, I really want to go on a mission. I want to go on a mission. I want to go to San Carlos. He really loved serving and enjoyed being out there with the people. So, what calling did you get after San Carlos? So, after San Carlos, then it was, again, another surprise um, that we were called back into the Miami Ward and served, I served as the Bishop of the Miami Ward. And that was different and interesting because we hadn't been in the Ward. So we hadn't been in the Ward for almost two years. And uh, so we had been at some activities, but we really spent a lot of our time out in San Carlos um, for church and for church activities, um, taking youth on campouts and doing other things just like a normal ward or branch would. And so we really didn't know the people. And so it was, um, President, again, President Wolf would ask me to just make a matter of prayer for who should be serving. So I received a list of names um, and I knew some people, um, but there were some distinctive names that came to my mind in terms of people who um, the Lord wanted serving at that time. Um, and again, it was kind of a surprise to me because you might, you might think, oh, there was someone else who'd been there for longer, but um, we had a, a neat experience with um, Brother Sister Tholander who had been coming back into activity and he worked with Sean Pierce in the ARP program for addiction recovery. And um, part of his testimony was how the Savior had helped him um, to change his life and to really make a difference uh, because he was always one drink away from being addicted again. Um, and so when he was called to help and serve within the bishopric as a clerk, um, he saw that as a huge responsibility and he said, I, didn't, I, I wouldn't think that I would be called to serve. And I said, it doesn't matter where you're called to serve. As long as you know that you're serving the Lord and you're serving his, his, you know, our brothers and sisters. And so it was a wonderful opportunity to be able to serve in the Miami Ward as a bishop. And um, uh, again, we had to kind of shift, shift gears. Our Miami Ward was an older ward uh, and some different needs than San Carlos had as, as different wards and branches are. And so we got to know the Miami Ward a little bit better uh, and enjoyed the time that we had spent, you know, spending time with uh, the Miami Ward, but also connecting with our San Carlos brothers and sisters, we still miss them. Um, but we served the Miami Ward, uh, and then after the Miami Ward, uh, President Wolf called me again and said that uh, he had submitted my name to serve uh, as um, a counselor in the state presidency, and that was, again, a surprise. So some people, and especially some of the state presidents I talked to, they had very distinct impressions of their callings and that they were going to be called to something. And um, I really had, didn't have those same experiences that I remember um, where I knew I'm gonna be called. I never wanted to be a bishop, never expected to be a bishop. You just serve 
where you grow where you're planted, you serve where you're, wherever you're called and whatever you're called to do. Um, but I can see in my life where there were just those opportunities to serve that allowed me to learn about um, church leadership and also how to love the people wherever we are and to you know, kind of try and figure out what the Lord wants you to do. It was never my plan to come to GLOW. My plan was to go to Oregon. Um, but the Lord had other plans. So, serving in GLOW has been a huge blessing because the people, the people make the biggest difference. And I appreciated the opportunity to serve with um, President Watts when we were first here. And then and President Wolf was in that presidency as well. But then also to serve with President Wolf how did, as a counselor and to learn from him. How did you serve with President Watts? What calling did you have? So President, when we were first uh, in Globe um, and the Miami Ward, um, we were called to serve uh, as, as served as President Watts' executive secretary. Uh, Paul Machula was the clerk, uh, President Crockett, and President Wolf were counselors to President Watts. And so that was interesting. Those dynamics were interesting because some of them were night owls, so they didn't mind late, late meetings. Um, <laughs> those of us who had earlier jobs, um, it, was, it, was just, it was an interesting, fun dynamic to see, uh, but to have that experience of how decisions were made, um, listening to the Spirit about callings and individuals, and that helped in the various callings that I've had to be able to understand, you know, why does the Lord ask certain people to serve? Why, is it, why are there distinct impressions with certain individuals and not the same with others? Um, but as a state presidency, they are always seeking the confirmation of the Spirit for callings that were given at a state level or within ward levels. Um, and, uh, and so, working with President Wolf, um, then several years later, it gave me the opportunity to, again, serve in a broader context of being able to interview and visit with people from around the state to meet with our superior, uh, brothers and sisters to meet with uh, Kearney brothers and sisters and to get a wider exposure um, such as we had served then in Globe, we'd served in Miami, we served in San Carlos and now we're able to serve in the state capacity of being able to uh, work with individuals um, in all the different uh, congregations throughout the state. So how long were you a counselor in the state presidency before you got your next calling? So I was in the state presidency for just under four years, for about three years and nine months. Um, and, uh, and then at the end of that time, I, uh, I was feeling a little relieved and it was the first, it was the first second counselor, and then called as the first counselor in the state presidency. And uh, I remember when President Wolf had said that they were going to be coming to release him. And I thought, oh, this is wonderful. We've served in these different callings, um, and now I get to sit with my family. I don't have to sit on the stand. I get to sit with my family. That was we. I just I always enjoyed sitting with my family, and I didn't always get to do that. And so I had my books all packed up and I was ready to go and um, uh, the process uh, that followed, uh, we had Elder DDA and Elder Webb, Elder DDA uh, was presiding and Elder Webb was an area authority from New Mexico and they came and did rounds of interviews with individuals and in my interview I talked about the stake and I talked about uh, the wonderful brethren who are experienced and can serve as a state president and, and do a great job. And uh, then I went back to my school office to work and do things there and, and then we got called back in or I got called back in. Uh, Susie, if you want to take it from where you got pulled in, because then they, 
Um, they kind of brought me back in, and I my thought was they're going to say, thank you for your service. We appreciate what you've done, um, and, uh, and then that would be it. Uh, that wasn't it. Well, they um, actually left you in the foyer, and they asked me to come back first, which was, so I... They called us in together, and they, yeah. and they brought her in first. And they left her in the foyer, and I had kids because I wasn't expecting to go there, so... I don't even know if they, we had just been on a hike. So we were just getting done with a hike and an adventure is um, our kids called it. And so I think I had one or two kids there and another one was with the grandparents. And I said, oh, dad just needs to meet with yeah, and We're gonna go see dad. So they said in the foyer with Trent and I went back and I think he asked only two questions. He just said, um, how, how, how does your husband, how is he as a husband? And he said, he's a very good husband. And um, they say, is he a good father? He said, yes. And they said, do you know why you're here? And I said, because you've asked us to come. And they said, well, we'll be calling him to be the state president. And so actually I got told before they told him. Um, so that was just, and that was this, as simple as the interview was. Always a surprise. <laughs> but just a very simple interview. Just how is he as a husband? And when they then, when they told you he was going to be called a state president, what did you think? I was kind of overwhelmed, um, and I had a good example for a mom, and I just, you know, knew that the Lord supports who He calls, and so I just thought the Lord supports who He calls. I and again the thought came of, you know, they asked how he was as a husband and how he was as a father. And he's a good husband, he's a good father, so the Lord knows his heart, so the Lord can, can take care of the rest. And so that was kind of, you know, like I said, I was kind of just in the, I don't think I even thought how could this be done as much as just the Lord supports. What were your thoughts, President Lane? Yeah, it, it, it was very overwhelming to me. I mean, so in some ways you were, quasi prepared because you've been a counselor, but my, that's not where my thought process was. Um, and I kind of guard against that in, in many ways because, they're, you know, seeing what the state president does is like seeing what a bishop does. If you've ever been a counselor for a bishop, you hate it when the bishop's gone because then you're the bishop, um, but you don't have the information. You just have people coming to you with things that are needed. Um, when the state president was gone and people had things, we didn't always know everything that was uh, happening and and uh, with confidentiality and so forth. So uh, being a state president, was a, it was a huge responsibility. Um, but we've never turned down a calling and we've always, again, just, we have been blessed to know to, that we, we know that we will be able to grow wherever we are and we serve wherever we're called. Um, but it was it was very overwhelming because then all of a sudden I already understand the next piece is now I need to find counselors. I need to know who needs to be called as counselors. And um, and that's a very humbling experience because they kind of say, they don't say, and they're not there to say, you know, you've got a week to do this. Um, you've got a half an hour. Um, other state presidents that I talked to did not have the similar experiences. Um, some state presidents knew that they would be the state president and called um, with quite a bit of time in preparation. And uh, it's, it's interesting to hear how different things kind of work within different places, but it was just, it was a short amount of time. And so I went to a different area in the state center and it was quiet and there was not really anybody else there. Um, and just seeking to know the will of the Lord, to know, because I wasn't expecting this. And it wasn't that I already had everything lined up or thought of. So, um, and going through that process and eventually um, settling on um, individuals that that came to my mind um, after making a matter of prayer 
Ähm, äh, I knew that we needed to have representation from um, different backgrounds, people with different experiences. And so, uh, Brother Ricky Lamb served as a first counselor, and uh, Brother Greg Lechemenau as a second counselor. Um, and I worked with them in different capacities, um, but now I knew that that was going to be um, a different experience with us in, as a state presidency. Uh, the clerk and the executive secretary kind of stay in place, and so that's helpful to have some continuity. Um, but it was a very emotional time. It was a very um, overwhelming time, again, because then I had to think, okay, now I don't get to sit with my family, um, and I want to make sure that my family's taken care of. Um, I think um, it was Elder Perry Webb, I believe, that talked to us. Um, and like I said, Elder Didier asked very few questions. Yeah. There was only the two questions, and you know, and just a matter of fact, this is what we're going to do. But I remember um, Elder Perry, I think Elder Perry Webb, right? I think. Elder Perry Webb, yeah. Yeah, I believe he was the one, and he could see that it was a little overwhelming. You know, even though we didn't, we didn't ask a lot of questions, he didn't say a lot of things. So when they called Trent back in and we're going to, they just kind of told him, matter of fact, this is what's going to happen. This is what you, and that was it. I mean, and they were kind of like, okay, get to work. But I remember Elder um, Webb saying to us as we left, um, he just said, um, Sister Lyon, if you're husband, we'll serve the Lord. Then... Um, I forgot the word he used, I think fully, if you'll fully serve the Lord without his heart, he said, your family will be blessed. And I remember thinking, like I said, I felt very much the Lord, the Lord supports, but I remember thinking, we can raise our family. We are good people and want to do good things. But if the Lord wants Trent and he's willing to help raise our family and help us, you know, that's probably the neatest blessing you could ever ask for. And we did feel the Lord's hand in helping us with our kids, and it wasn't the easiest age. Um, we had one almost two, she was about 12 and a half, and then we had young. And the boys were still, I think, Nate was seven, and Reed was between. And so, but I did feel like the Lord did fulfill that promise of helping us with our family during that time. And so, even though it was very few words said, um, the words that needed to be heard were heard. So, as a state president or during your state presidency, um, do you feel like there were any themes that sort of came out through the stake, any areas of focus? Well, having been in the state presidency and having been around the wards, um, and as we talked about needs within the stake, we saw, of course, the need for um, the temple to be a focus uh, and for people to be spiritually prepared for the times that are at hand, spiritually and temporally um, prepared. Uh, the canneries were up and going and there was an emphasis on uh, preparedness in general, but we really saw the need for spiritual preparedness and making sure that our members were spiritually prepared and we felt that the temple was the way to focus on that. Um, ministering was another piece uh, so that we would uh, have individuals uh, able to come and participate in their various wards or organizations, um, and then the youth. Um, so, uh, one thing that I wasn't aware of is that we had uh, coordinating councils and welfare councils, and these councils were made up of other state presidents or other, uh, but usually state presidents who would meet and talk over different issues, and um, for some that was an overwhelming thing, and for others, because it was a... Uh, not a Sunday meeting, uh, but it gave you an idea of different things you met with, a regional representative, you met with a temple president, you met with a mission president, 
and you kind of listened and learned about the prophetic priorities and how those were coming about in different stakes, but each stake had to really focus on the things that were most important to it. And so that, um, that preparedness and, and getting to the temple um, was a, a focus that I think we uh, tried to emphasize, uh, including things that have been done in the past, but having things that united the stake. Um, we really didn't want the outlying areas to feel like they were uh, forgotten or that they were not a part of the important strength that the stake was. And so uh, we tried to hold those activities like temple, temple nights <clears throat> and temple days where the stake would serve in the temple all day. Um, we, <clears throat> after stake conference, started to have linger longers. Sometimes a war will have a linger longer, but this was a stake linger longer. And that, for some people, was like, hmm. But after the adult meeting on Saturday, we just wanted people to be able to sit down and have to be able to talk to each other, to be able to connect with each other, um, and bring each other together in a unified kind of a way. Uh, the temple meeting with the temple president gave us an opportunity, uh, a different opportunity to be able to be called as a veil worker in the temple. And um, that, that provided uh, some really neat moments as we were able to have stake or wards that we were in the temple with in a session. And then they would call up those who were veil workers to then go through, and then we would stand at the veil, and then we would bring people through the veil. And that was very touching, especially um, one time I remember there was a, uh, a brother who was just coming back from activity, from inactivity or less, being less active. And it was his first time in the temple, back in the temple after being gone for some time. And just hearing his voice, and then when he came through the veil and saw me and we embraced, it was a wonderful opportunity um, to just show love and express love that the Lord has for each of his children. Um, just those opportunities to be able to, to, to serve in that way. Uh, so anyway, the, those are some of the things that we focus on was the uh, spiritual and temporal preparedness, uh, unifying, you know, becoming a Zion. Everyone wants to you know, work on the activity and helping people become more of a Zion people, a unified people. Uh, and that's not, that's not an easy thing when you're, uh, again, in separate places and not too, too far, where you're kind of far away from each other. Um, and then there was a lot with ministering and bringing people back. Um, we really wanted the bishops and branch presidents to try and again, work with those who were less active, especially our prospective elders, and helping them realize the blessings um, that can be had as they took their families to the temple, as they um, were active in the church. Um, that was exciting. As I look back through journals, uh, having those opportunities to visit with um, missionaries uh, and prospective elders before they go on a mission or before they receive the Melchizedek Priesthood was a wonderful opportunity to go through the scriptures and, and just help the individual who's there to see how great the, the Lord is in our lives. Um, having those missionaries serve and then come back and uh, share what they learned, what they did, and then have that be a strength for our youth. Um, and many of them still serving in the Globe Stake even right now and living here and now. Um, again, the Lord is in the details and the Lord's in charge. He knows, um, he knows what needs to happen. And as we create space to listen to his voice and find his voice, um, we're able to find the things that, that he wants us to be able to do. So as a stake, uh, there are changes, people moving in and out, but to try to keep that continuity. Um, uh, we eventually, I don't know where you want to go from here, but um, um, our stint at, as being a state president was uh, shorter than most. Um, as uh, we eventually moved to the Valley, I took a position uh, as a turnaround principal for a middle school in the Valley, and I didn't know how long that would last. But what I realized was that the time that I spent there in the first year 
Um, I would come back on weekends, so I was in the valley during the week, and you could do things with telephones and have meetings, but a state president really needs to be there with the people, and um, and I didn't feel that that was that I was able to serve in the way that I felt the Lord would would need, and so um, I talked to Elder Webb and just kind of gave my circumstance and realized that I might be staying in the valley a little bit longer than I might have thought. Uh, and that our family was going to be moving. And so, um, so we uh, then had um, uh, the opportunity to see President Dalton be called as this new state president. He had been one of my counselors and a great uh, man and a great friend. And um, I didn't feel at all bad turning the stake over to President Dalton and uh, to see the wonderful things that he, he would do with that. But we were saddened to see uh, the state go, but we certainly knew we would always be coming back and visit and always be a part of the stake, just like the stake will always be a part of us. So we could probably go on all night. Uh, you guys, the two of you have uh, shared a lot of wonderful experiences and I think people are going to find this fascinating and very interesting. But we're going to have to close this uh, fairly soon. Um, President Lyon, are there any are there any other so, uh, are there any other activities, experiences as stake president you'd like to share? And then I'd like to invite both of you, perhaps uh, Sister Lyon first, and then the new President Lyon next, to just leave a brief testimony with us. You know, there, there are a lot of a lot of little experiences that, that, that stand out. We had um, we had some really wonderful youth activities. Um, we were able to put together a, a challenging pioneer trek um, with great leaders helping out in all capacities, um, and some of the youth even. Uh, later on, even after they graduated from high school, would come back and talk to me about some of those experiences that they had there. Uh, some of them, the spiritual experiences that they that they had. Others, you know, cutting off a chicken's head and eating that chicken. That was an experience all in itself. Um, I think some of the experiences that that are memorable for me involve just some of the individuals that we worked with. Um, Oftentimes, receiving the impression to call individuals um, where, again, they may not have seen themselves as the person who would be taking on that responsibility. Um, and yet, as they served, they served faithfully, they served well, um, and they were blessed because of that. Um, there were opportunities to visit with individuals and youth even where the young person might not want to visit with their bishop but they would visit with their state president and they didn't necessarily know their state president any better but they just didn't necessarily want to visit with their bishop and um, um, and being in challenging circumstances uh talking with them and counseling with them and helping them along some of those um, very difficult teenage years and then seeing that and not knowing what happens after we left but realizing that uh, sometimes those conversations made a difference in that individual staying active and changing generations whereas the trajectory that they had before was not in that way um, again, perfected elders and those who were not thinking about being active in the church and then being challenged um, and invited, ministered to, and then seeing them get to the temple and remain active and, um, and be contributors here in the state. Um, 
You know, so there were a number of different activities, but more of it was serving individuals and working with those individuals um, and seeing lives change um, and seeing the Lord in the difference there, where when people made the changes in their life that they needed to, they saw that, they saw that the Lord made those changes in their life and that made a difference for them. So I think that's, that's about where I would leave that. Um, cause yeah, could, we could talk for a lot about different, different types of experiences, but I remember one brother just came and come up and just kind of say, you know, I said, I asked him you know, why he was coming back to church and he said, you told me that I could become a new creature. And I said, well, I didn't necessarily say that. That's what the scriptures teach. And he says, but that stuck with me. And I said, I want to become a new creature. And he had many people ministering to him and helping him um, to become a new creature, to serve mission, to be able to help his grandchildren. Um, that makes a difference to me in the lives of those, uh, those individuals one by one. That's the way the Savior went about his ministry, was preaching and teaching to the one. Sister Lyon, anything else you want to add there? I think you summed it up well. The people at the stake just growing up in the stake and being part of the stake for almost as long as I can remember. Um, they were just, it was just part of being family and looking out after each other. So it was just a, it's a very good stake, a very good experience to work with others in different ways and seeing others serve. Um, when they put in President Dalton, I just remember that feeling of just how needed is that the church goes forward. It's not about the individual. It's about who the Lord wants. And that's a neat feeling to see that the Lord loves his people, that he always makes sure there's someone there ready to serve. So that's a neat feeling to love people and always have them be loved by their Heavenly Father that they can serve and be served. I think our testimony was strengthened of the, the Savior in our lives. Um, And an appreciation for the atonement and the, the sacrifice of the Savior for us. Um, I learned that, and I knew, but you just feel it deeper. That the Lord knows us as individuals. He knows who we are. He knows our individual needs. He knows what we need. And sometimes that comes in the form of a call. Sometimes that comes in the form of uh, someone reaching out to you. Sometimes that um, comes in how um, someone just says something to you. Um, but the Lord knows who we are. Um, we have a loving Heavenly Father, and He has uh, a plan for us to return back to Him. And the experiences that we had in serving in the Globe Stake helped bring us closer to our brothers and sisters within the stake. And there, um, we look forward to coming back to events uh, in the stick and meeting with people. And we will look forward to seeing some who have passed on and to visit with them because there are many who have passed on uh, from the stake who strengthen our testimonies and helped us to know that Jesus is the Christ. As Susie said, that um, we, the rest, we are part of the restoration and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ um, allows us to change and gives us an opportunity for our hearts to change and for our willingness to serve and to love, to forgive, and to do what we can to help all of Heavenly Father's children to return back to Him, to invite others to come unto Christ. Um, I just, I know that our Heavenly Father is in those details. The Lord is in charge of the church. He is in charge. He knows us. He loves us. And He wants us to return. He's provided a way for us to do that. 
through covenants, but also through the relationships that we have with one another. Um, and I know that to be true. And I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you very much uh, for your words and uh, for sharing some of these stories with us.